So at this point, I'm, um, I'm really just so excited to have Doug Tallamy with us again. I think we've had Doug um, maybe a half a dozen times for our different webinar series, and all of those are posted on our um, B-Lab website and also our YouTube channel. But one of our most popular presenters, um, really kind of the, um, I guess you could say maybe one of the Pied Pipers in the movement of getting all of us to enhance and add to our habitat in our backyards and community garden spaces or uh, parks and other public spaces to enhance that habitat for wildlife. Uh, Doug is a professor at University of Delaware, also an acclaimed author. Um, some of his titles there on the screen, including Nature's Best Hope, uh, The Nature of Oaks, and Bringing Nature Home. For those of us who have that kind of gardening or horticulture background, The Living Landscape with Rick Dark, um, a title that many of us keep handy, great charts, um, suggestions for plants to use in different, um, different needs in the landscape. So uh, an acclaimed author, a uh, wonderful presenter, and really someone to get us um, really excited and motivated about um, incorporating native plants and other elements to bring pollinators to our garden. So, Doug, thanks again for being with us and um, turning the slide set over to you. Okay, thank you, Denise. Can you see this, Denise? Is it up? Yes, it is. All right, great. Um, okay, well, thanks. Uh, thanks for coming, everybody. Um, I have to admit right off, I had a visit from my grandchildren the other day. Both of them were sick, and now I have a cold. So this may be the first time I've ever blown my nose in front of 2,700 people. It's going to happen, but... So I apologize for that. Um, I, I call this Our Pollinator's Best Hope. Um, and I will give you a spoiler right now. You are our pollinator's best hope. If we don't modify the way we're landscaping, we're going to lose a lot of pollinators, which is not an option. Uh, now, back in 2016, E.O. Wilson wrote Half Earth, Our Planet's Fight for Life. Uh, and he had a very, very, um, it was kind of a stark statement. He said, we're going to lose life everywhere on planet Earth. It's all going to crash unless we save nature, unless we save functional ecosystems, unless we save those habitats we're talking about on at least half of the Earth. And he spent most of the book talking about the science that supports that statement. And then he ended the book. He didn't spend a lot of time telling us how we were going to do that. Of course, to a, a conservation biologist, putting half the Earth aside would be just a wonderful thing. We could save all of all those creatures that we love and all the plants. But... Half of planet Earth is already in some form of agriculture, and we've got just about 8 billion people in the other half of all of our houses and roadways and detritus, and we don't have a third half uh, to put aside for uh, nature. So how can we do this? Uh, it's basically what I want to talk about today. I do think we can, we can realize EO's dream. We can create those habitats on half of the Earth, but we're, we need a new approach to conservation in order to do that. Before I talk about that, though, let me let me uh, remind you what happened in 2019, I guess it was. We had a very big um, oak mast. <laughs> Members of the Red Oak group got together and decided to make their acorns at the same time. And this is what it looked like in a lot of places. Well, I'm easily entertained, so I took one of those acorns and I just stared at it. And I was rewarded because an insect started to chew its way out of the acorn. First, it chewed a little hole for its head, then it forced its head through there. It was a tight squeeze finally worked its entire body through that tiny hole. And then it plopped down. And that's a dangerous time for this, this uh, larva because it's good to eat. A lot of things are after it. So it gets to safety by wiggling and squirming beneath the soil surface. It takes about 30 seconds. And once it's underground, it stretches in all directions and forms a chamber. And within that chamber, uh, it converts itself to a pupa. And then surprisingly stays as a pupa underground in that chamber for two years. After two years, comes out as an acorn weevil. That's what an acorn weevil looks like. A lot of people think weevils have big noses because it looks like they do, but that's actually an extension of the head capsule. And the mouth parts are way down here at the end of that extension. And they take those mouth parts to a hole into the center of the acorn, turn around, lay an egg in it, and that is how the larva gets into the acorn. Why do they spend two years underground? Why don't they come out the very next year? Well, it takes red oak acorns 18 months to complete their development. So if they came out the next year, there wouldn't be enough acorns for them. Of course, after they leave the acorn, uh, it leaves a hole, kind of like a true vacuum. And you know that nature abhors a vacuum. And in this case, she's filled it with three species of chemnothorax ants, tiny little ants where the entire colony lives in the holes made by acorn weevils after they have left the acorn. And if scouts find a new hole in a new acorn, they get all excited because their old uh, acorn is falling apart. 
So they tell everybody it's time to move. They grab the larvae, they grab the eggs, the entire colony is transferred into the new egg corn. That takes about 30 minutes. And then they post a guard here to make sure that nobody else comes in. And that's where they'll live for the next two years until this egg corn disintegrates. So what's my point with this little story? That is just one of literally millions of very specialized interactions that comprise the bulk of nature. They're largely interactions between animals and plants. Now, this is another one, the relationship between jays and egg corns. Jays are the primary dispersers of, of oak egg corns. They'll take an acorn and they'll fly up to a mile from the parent tree and they, they find a disturbed area and tap the, the acorn beneath the surface. Uh, and then they're going to go back in the wintertime and have something to eat. <clears throat> Well, for every four acorns a jay buries in the fall, they only remember where one is. So for every four acorns they bury, they've actually planted three oak trees. Specialized interaction between pileated woodpeckers and carpenter ants. That's what they rear their young on, carpenter ants. So you won't have pileated woodpeckers unless you have a lot of carpenter ants, and you won't have a lot of carpenter ants unless you have the big trees that make those carpenter ants. In California, there are 60 species of native bees that depend on the pollen from, from sunflowers. It turns out that pollen specialization is very common in our, our native bees. We have about 4,000 species of native bees, and you're going to hear a lot about them in the, the coming uh, webinars. But over a third of them are highly specialized. You don't have the plant that they require. You don't have that bee. Remember what habitat is. It's not just a place to live. It's the food requirements that you have. And in this case, they're very specialized. You won't have the, the Baltimore checker spot unless you have white turtle head. I could go on and on, talk about nature specialized relationships all day, all week, all year. Point I wanna make today though, is that these relationships, nature itself is now on the ropes. And it's on the ropes because we didn't take Teddy Roosevelt's advice. Way back in 1908, Teddy heard that the state of Arizona was going to mine the Grand Canyon. So he went to the canyon, looked out over its edge, and he said, uh, leave it as it is. And with those five words, he started the process of creating the, the Grand Canyon National Park. Well, we didn't leave most of the country as it was. Um, there's only about 5% of the country that's anything close to its original pristine ecological condition. And those are typically mountaintops. And that's because we have logged the country repeatedly. We have tilled it. We have drained it. We've grazed it. It's 770 million acres of rangeland. That's four and a half times the size of Texas dedicated to cattle. And of course, we paved it or otherwise developed it. We have straightened our rivers and dammed them. And you can spell that any way you want. We have polluted our skies and changed our climate for centuries to come. We've drained our aquifers. We've introduced more than 3,300 species of plants from other continents, many of which are running amok in our natural areas. In short, we have carved up those natural areas into tiny remnants of their former selves. And each one of those remnants is too small and too isolated to sustain the amount of nature that we humans need to run the ecosystems that provide our life support. <coughs> Excuse me. Why have we done this? I don't know. But I suspect we thought that, that Earth, our nest, was so big, we could foul it forever and there wouldn't be any consequences. Of course, we were wrong about that. And that's why we're seeing some pretty scary headlines these days, like the insect apocalypse is here. What does it mean for the rest of life on Earth? Talking about global insect decline. Followed by this one. <clears throat> North America has lost 3 billion breeding birds in the last 50 years. That's just about a third of our North American bird population already gone. The UN says we're going to lose a million species to extinction, probably in the next 20 years. And they said it two years ago. So what is that now? The next 18 years. Nice headline. But it is not an option, folks. These are the species that keep us alive on planet Earth. We have to get serious about the conservation required to save these species. So I can go on talking about the pox that we humans have, have uh, delivered upon the environment, that's upon all of our houses. But that's not what this talk is about. This talk is about a cure for that pox. It's a cure that'll take small efforts from lots of people, people like you and me, but they will deliver enormous physical, psychological, and environmental benefits to everybody. Let's return briefly to this headline. Insect apocalypse is here. What does it mean for the rest of life on Earth? Well, back to E.O. Wilson. He told us what it would mean if Earth lost its insects, and he did it in a paper way back in 1987 called The Little Things That Run the World. And his message again was clear. Life as we know it depends on insects. <clears throat> and this is... This was one of the papers that, that um, made me say repeatedly, no, it's not all about pollinators. It's not all about pollinators. 
but it might be all about pollinators. I, I, I might have been wrong about that. Life as we know it depends on pollinators because uh, most of the plants that establish the carrying capacity of planet Earth are insect pollinated. If we lost our insects, we would lose um, most of those flowering plants. And if we lost those flowering plants, it would change energy flow through our terrestrial ecosystems to the point where the food webs that support everything else, the amphibians, the reptiles, the birds, the mammals, those food webs would collapse if you lost the plants that are insect pollinated. And all of those animals would disappear. The biosphere, the living portion of the earth would rot because we would have lost insect decomposers and all we would have is bacteria and fungi. And humans, of course, wouldn't survive any of those drastic changes. Now, there is some good news here, and that is that <clears throat> we can save our pollinators. We can save all of our insects. We can save our birds. We can save nature itself. We can save ourselves. But we're going to have to change the way we landscape in order to do it. Why is that? Well, remember, humans are products of nature. We are totally dependent on the life support that functioning ecosystems provide. That's what Wilson was talking about when he said, we need this on at least half of the planet. These are just a few of the things that plants do that we depend on, like produce oxygen, pretty important. Cleaner water, slow its journey to the sea where it becomes too salty to use. Carbon capture, enormously important today. Plants are, are pulling carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, building their tissues out of them, and then even more important, pumping the carbon into the ground through their root systems for long-term storage. And by long-term storage, I mean thousands of years. Plants are building topsoil, holding it in place. They're preventing floods, dampening severe weather, converting sunlight into food. If we lost our plants, we'd have to eat sunlight. That's going to be hard. This is plants. Most of them are created by pollinators. What do animals do for plants? Well, they do provide pest control services. That's good. There's that pollination. 90% of our flowering plants are, are pollinated by uh, animals. They disperse plant seeds. So designing landscapes like this that destroy the production of, of um, ecosystem services is, is just not a good idea. Never was a good idea, but today it's, it's actually a terrible idea because we have so many people demanding ecosystem services more and more every day. We're getting them, but only by taking them away from other living things. So if you're wondering, people argue about what the carrying capacity of the planet is. In other words, how much life can it support? You know you're over the carrying capacity when you're using resources faster than the earth is, is uh, developing new ones. And just think about all the resources we're running out of. We're certainly doing that today. Now we do have parks and we have preserves and they're doing the best they can. Uh, but we are in the sixth great extinction event. So obviously it's not good enough. We now need to move outside of parks and preserves and practice conservation on properties just like this. There have been visionaries through the ages who have recognized that, that uh, we humans need to work on our relationship with planet Earth. And Aldo Leopold was one of the most eloquent. He wrote extensively in the first half of the 1900s. One of the things he said is the oldest task in human history is to live in a piece of land without spoiling it. There have been indigenous groups that have been good at doing that, but our huge Western societies and our huge Asian societies are terrible at doing that. We habitually take more from the earth than it has to offer, completely wrecking an area, going to another area, doing the same thing, not sustainable behavior. But Otto Leopold had a lot of faith in humans. He believed we could develop what he called a land ethic. He knew we had to use the land. We had to farm and lumber and graze and do all of those things. But he believed that we could learn to do them gently enough that we did not destroy local ecosystems. That's what he called uh, a land ethic, and he wrote about it in the Sand County Almanac. What he did not write about, though, was developing a land ethic where we actually lived. And I'm not sure why that was, but I suspect the notion that humans and nature cannot live together. We cannot coexist in the same place in the same time. That notion was so deeply embedded in the culture of Aldo Leopold's day, still embedded in our own culture, that he may not have recognized it as an option. What I want to argue this morning is that not only is living with nature an option, it's now the only viable option that's left to us. In the past, of course, conservationists worked pretty much exclusively where there weren't a lot of people. We now need to turn that on its head and practice conservation where there are a lot of people, because that's pretty much everywhere. 
In other words, we've got to find ways for nature to thrive in human dominated landscapes, not hang on by a thread, not get diminished every single year, but actually thrive. Where should we start? Well, back to, back to private property. Uh, if we don't practice conservation of private property, we're going to fail because most of the land is privately owned. 78% of the entire country is privately owned. 85.6% of the U.S. east of the Mississippi is privately owned. We've got 135 million acres of residential landscapes in the U.S. We can't ignore all of those properties. Now, when I talk about conservation, I'm not really using the word correctly. We certainly want to conserve any bits of nature that are that are out there that we have not already destroyed. That has been our model for the last century, uh, and we want to keep doing that. Uh, but now I'm talking about restoration. We need to put it back together again. We need to, to reunite enough of those specialized interactions so that we have functioning ecosystems in places where we've dismantled them. It may not be exactly what was there at some point in the past, uh, but it still can provide ecosystem services. But <clears throat> not all species contribute to ecosystem function equally, so we're going to have to start with the building blocks. And those flowering plants and the pollinators that allow those plants to reproduce are one of the important building blocks, probably the most important building block. <coughs> Excuse me. Why? Because they are, through photosynthesis, capturing energy from the sun and turning it into food. That is the food that keeps just about all the animals on the planet a lot. But now the food is stored in plant parts, mostly leaves. If we don't get that food to the animals, we don't have any animals, and then we don't have any functioning ecosystems. Well, most vertebrates don't eat plants directly. Most vertebrates eat invertebrates that ate those plants. Most of those invertebrates are insects, and not just any insect. It turns out that caterpillars are transferring more energy from plants to other animals than any other type of plant eater. So if we design landscapes without a lot of caterpillars in them, without the plants that make those caterpillars in them, we're going to have failed food webs and failed ecosystems. The good news is many of the adults of a lot of these caterpillars are pollinators in and of themselves. They do it at night, so we don't typically recognize them, but they're very important out there. <clears throat> Let's talk about Carolina chickadee as an example. Um, they, of course, are the birds. Uh, there's several species of chickadees around the country, uh, and they're the birds that are frequent our feeders all winter long, eating seeds. We tend to think that's all they need is seeds. Uh, even in the wintertime, 50% of their diet is seeds. The other 50% is insects and spiders. But when they're reproducing, their babies can't eat seeds at all. So they switch entirely to, to um, arthropods, mostly insects. And if they're in a healthy environment, they will rear their young exclusively on caterpillars. And they are not exceptions. 96% of our terrestrial birds rear their young on insects, and most of those insects are caterpillars. How do I know that? Well, there's a number of lines of evidence that suggest that, but this is this is a citizen science project that one of my students, Ashley Kennedy, did a couple of years ago. She put out a call to bird photographers around the country and said, please take pictures of birds during the breeding season when they are carrying food to the nest. Send those pictures to me, Ashley. I will identify the prey items that are in the beaks of the birds and reconstruct the nestling diet for as many species of, of birds in the U.S. as I can. And this is a summary of her results. She got thousands of pictures, did a lot of identifying. The green bars are the percentage of those nestling diets of the 20 most common bird families in, in North America that were caterpillars. And in 16 out of the 20 common bird families, caterpillars dominated the diet. So again, what would happen to all these breeding birds if we didn't have enough caterpillars? Many of them would not be able to breed at all. So... Why caterpillars? What's special about caterpillars? A number of things are special, including the fact that they are soft. Think of this guy as if he's a little, little sausage with a very thin wrapper. The thin wrapper is his exoskeleton. It's made of chitin. It's undigestible. The birds don't want a lot of, of undigestible material. And because the caterpillar is soft, you can stuff it down the throat of your offspring without fear of injuring them. If you've ever watched a parent bird rear their young, they're pretty rough. Beaks like a plunger. They just stuff it down there. Caterpillars are also relatively large prey items. One medium-sized caterpillar is equal to the biomass of 200 aphids. Now, many of our smaller birds do chase aphids around, but do you want to chase 200 aphids or get one caterpillar? They're nutritious. They're very high in fat, very high in protein. Low percentage of, of chitin, of exoskeleton, compared to many other types of insects, particularly beetles. Beetles are not like little sausages. They're like little tanks. 
much of a beetle is, is undigestible and many beetles have really sharp edges too. And finally, it turns out caterpillars are the best source of carotenoids uh, for birds during the breeding season. Now I mentioned carotenoids, um, not because I love organic chemistry, but because I'm a vertebrate and you're a vertebrate and birds are vertebrates and we vertebrates cannot make our own carotenoids. Only plants make carotenoids. So we have to get our carotenoids from plants and we have to get them from plants because carotenoids are essential components of vertebrate diets. Where are the birds getting their carotenoids from during the breeding season? From, from the prey that they're bringing to the nest, of course. But look, carotenoid content is not equally distributed among bird prey items. These first two bars here are types of caterpillars. They have far more carotenoids than other types of bird prey. Here are the adult caterpillars. Here are the moths and butterflies themselves. Uh, they have far fewer carotenoids because they're not eating green leaves. The carotenoids are in the green leaves. Only the caterpillars are eating green leaves. And here's the earthworm way down here. So the early bird gets the worm, but it doesn't get any carotenoids when he gets the worm. So that study and several others are suggesting the caterpillars are not optional parts of bird diets. It's really looking like they're essential parts of most bird diets. So let's just say most birds need caterpillars. All right, the next question is how many do they need? Is one or two enough? One or two a day enough? <clears throat> Let's go back to chickadees. There's a lot of data on chickadees. How many caterpillars does it take to make a nest of chickadees? One or two is not enough. One or two a day is not enough. It takes thousands, 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars to get one clutch of chickadees to the point where they leave the nest, where they fledge. And after they fledge, the parents continue to feed them caterpillars for another 21 days, but they're flying all around so nobody can count them. But it's got to be tens of thousands of caterpillars required to get one clutch of a bird that's a third of an ounce four pennies worth of bird through to independence. And of course, after they're independent, they continue to eat caterpillars. And if you want chickadees to breed in your yard, and I would think uh, you do, because in so many places, that's all we have is our yards. You have to have all those caterpillars in your yard because chickadees only forage 50 meters from the nest. And that is true for most birds. They forage very close to the nest because they're making so many trips every day. And if we landscape in a way that uh, does not encourage all of those caterpillars in our yards. That's called insect decline. And it's really looking like insect decline is directly related to the bird declines that people are measuring. We went to the original data set of Rosenberg et al., the Smithsonian group that said we have lost 3 billion birds in the last 50 years. And we divided the terrestrial species into two groups, the birds that require insects, typically when they are breeding, and the birds that do not require insects, things like doves and finches can, act, can reproduce on seeds. They make a little, little milk out of the seeds and they feed that to their baby. And look, the birds that do not require insects did not decline at all in the last 50 years. But the birds that require insects decline on average 10 million individuals per species. This doesn't prove cause and effect, but it certainly does suggest that as you take bird food away, you lose the birds. <clears throat> So how do we landscape for, for caterpillars and for the pollinators that enable the plants to exist to make those caterpillars? That's how we have to start thinking about, about landscapes. Um, in the past, we've thought about them in, in terms of one function, and that is being beautiful. Great, we're gonna keep that, but now we have to have beautiful landscapes that are also ecologically functional, and they've got to include these two groups of insects. But you do that by adding the insects, uh, you, add, you do add these insects, to your landscape by adding the plants that support those insects. It seems pretty straightforward, but there is a catch. And that is that um, most plants don't support a lot of caterpillars or a lot of specialist pollinators. So we have to be fussy about which plants we're gonna, we're gonna put in our yard. And we have to be fussy about it because the caterpillars and the pollinators are fussy themselves. And the monarch butterfly illustrates that perfectly. You can have all the crepe myrtle and all the calorie pear and all the burning bush and all the ginkgos and all the camellias and all the hostas, all the things we typically landscape with in our yards, and you won't make a single monarch butterfly. The only thing that's going to make a monarch butterfly is a milkweed. <clears throat> that's called host plant specialization. It turns out most of the insects that eat plants are host plant specialists. They can only eat the plants um, on which they have specialized over evolutionary time. Why are so many insect specialists? Because plants have made them that way. Plants don't want to be eaten. 
Plants want to capture the energy from the sun and use it for their own growth and reproduction. So they've loaded their leaves with nasty tasting chemicals, secondary metabolic compounds that make those leaves either bitter or downright toxic. And if you don't believe me after this talk today, go out and eat a plant. See if you like it. You're not going to like it. It's a, it's a wonderful defense that keeps most of the insects of the world from eating most of the plants of the world. And that's why it's green out there. It's not because there's no insects out there that want to eat those plants. It's because most of the insects that are out there cannot eat most of the plants. They are too well protected. There's a reason it is hard to get our kids to eat vegetables. They inherently know that they're toxic. But we do know that insects eat plants. So how do they do that? How do they get around those chemical defenses? Well, this is where the specialization comes in. 90% of the insects that eat plants are what we call host plant specialists. They can only eat the particular plants for which they have specialized enzymes that store and excrete and detoxify those compounds, specialized behavioral adaptations and life history adaptations that minimize their exposure to those compounds. But it takes a long period of evolutionary history for those plant lineages for all those adaptations to fall into place. And once they do, the insect is locked into eating that particular plant. So if you take the milkweeds out of your yard and replace them with hostas, the monarch's not gonna start to develop on your hostas. It can't, it's locked into milkweeds and it has two choices then, go find milkweeds someplace else or starve to death. Same story with specialist bees. That third of the bees that can only reproduce on the pollen of particular plants, um, plants want bees to specialize. They want their pollen to be carried to another uh, flower of the same species, so you get very efficient pollination. And specialist pollinators have particular hairs on their bodies. They're really good at doing that. They're not flying all over to a bunch of other plants and carrying the pollen away, whereas generalist pollinators are going all over the place. They're not, not um, that efficient in terms of transferring pollen. Uh, so specialist pollinators need particular plants. And if you're making a, a, a pollinator garden, you want to focus on the plants that support specialists because the generalists will use them as well. But it turns out, let's just boil this down. <sighs> there are three types of plants out there. There are plants that contribute energy to local food webs. There are plants that do not contribute energy to local food webs. And there are plants that actively detract energy from local food webs. A good example of a contributor would be one of the oaks. <laughs> genus Quercus. Oaks contribute more energy than any other plant uh, in North America to local food webs. They're willing to share the energy they've captured from the sun. Good example of a non-contributor would be a ginkgo. Nothing eats a ginkgo. Um, so they're there, they're pretty, they're sitting in our landscape. They're not invasive, they're not moving around, um, but they're not contributing either. And a good example of a non-contributor would be one of the invasive uh, ornamentals like calorie pear or burning bush or barberry, and we've got a bunch of them. Um, that actively displace native plant communities. Um, and these guys are very terrible at supporting food webs, but they're pushing out the ones that are good at doing that. So what I'm trying to say here is that plant choice matters. If we're trying to reestablish the food webs that support local ecosystems, uh, we need to choose the right plants or it's not going to work. And I'm going to give you three examples of how well it does work when we do choose the right plants starting with uh, our house right here in Oxford, Pennsylvania. It's where my wife, Cindy, and I moved in the year 2000. It was to a farm that had been broken up into 10-acre lots. Very old farm, had been, been uh, mowed for hay before we moved in, so very, very few plants there. Uh, and, and our general goal was to restore this, this ecosystem, put the plants back. Uh, and of course, you're not going to restore it without putting the caterpillars back. So um, I targeted particular caterpillars. I wanted to see if I could get the Canadian owlet making a living at our house. Um, that's what a Canadian owlet looks like. That's what the adult looks like, just like a leaf. We're not going to have Canadian owlets unless you have meadow root. That's the only plant that they can develop on. I, we didn't have any meadow root. Um, I'm sure it was here hundreds of years ago. Our, our area has been farmed for about 300 years. <laughs> Excuse me. So I got some meadow root seeds from someplace. I planted them. They grew very nicely. But this was early on, and I, I actually had very little faith that Canadian outlets would be able to find my meadow root. So after I planted them, I didn't even go out and check it for at least two months afterwards. Then I was walking by for another reason, and Lo and behold, they were covered with Canadian outlets. They had found it right away. I'm still surprised about that. 
So now we have a good population of metaroo and Canadian alex. We've added two species to, to our little ecosystem. The restoration has begun. Same story with the goldenrod stowaway, a beautiful orange moth. Actually, it's a misnomer. It has nothing to do with goldenrod. It's a specialist on this plant, Biden's aristosa, ditch daisy. Um, we didn't have any ditch daisy, but I knew where there was some in a power line cut about 14 miles away. So I got some seeds. I planted them at home. They grew very nicely. They actually took over my front yard. Uh, that's what it looked like this year. Uh, so nice display, but it took a full year for the goldenrod stowaway to find my Bidens before they did. They have. So now we have a good population of both of these. Now we've added four species to the uh, to our yard. I wanted Andrena phacillii. Um, that's, that's a specialist on phacillia. We, so we planted phacillia. Uh, and surprisingly, it came right away. Um, so you can do this with pollinators as well. Uh, those specialist pollinators wanted the hackberry emperor. Not because it's the most beautiful butterfly in the world, but because uh, it's it belongs here. It's one of the species that ought to be at our house. And as its name suggests, it's a specialist on hackberry. On Celtus. So we didn't have any hackberry, but I planted some, planted, I don't know, four or five trees. I had to wait four years for the uh, hackberry emperor to come, but it finally did. And now we have a good population of, of those. And so that's, that's how the restoration proceeded. I did not plant goldenrod, came in on its own. And along with it came many of the things that specialize on goldenrod, like the beautiful brown hooded owlet, the arsidra flower moth, the goldenrod leaf miner, the distinct sparaginothus, the goldenrod gall moth, and many more. Goldenrod supports 110 species of caterpillars, bird food, 110 species of bird food. I planted Virginia creeper. Uh, yeah, Virginia creeper. I hear that people don't like it. I don't, I don't know why. It's got good fall color. Um, it, it can climb our trees without girdling them. So that's good. It's a good ground cover. Makes valuable berries, nutritious berries for the birds in the fall. Migrating birds need berries that are high in fat. And that's what these, these berries are. It's a great pollinator plant, believe it or not. The flowers are tiny and inconspicuous. And you don't even know it's in bloom until you see this big cloud of native bees around it. So remember, when you're making a pollinator garden, you're making it for the pollinators. If it's not big and showy for you, that's okay. I plant a Virginia creeper because it's the best source of the, it's a host plant for the large sphinx moths that are a primary component of cardinal diets. Things like the Pandora sphinx and its beautiful adult, the lettered sphinx, the hog sphinx, the avid sphinx, all on Virginia creeper. I want to see if I get the double tooth prominent uh, at, at our house, just because it's such a cool looking caterpillar. Even if you don't like caterpillars, you got to like this guy. Well, it's a specialist on, on elm, particularly American elm. And of course, we lost our American elm to Dutch elm disease decades ago. But there are two American elms at the University of Delaware that did not die. Every year, they drop a lot of seeds. I gathered some seeds up from the gutter, planted them at home. They grew very nicely. Those trees are 80 feet tall now. And they brought in the double tooth prominent. Another big success, American elm. Wanted the evening primrose moth, just because it's beautiful. I like beauty like anybody else. And believe it or not, we had no evening primrose, no, no Edithera. So I planted that. The moth came, spends the day with its head stuffed in the flowers. Sometimes it gets crowded, but they're all very cute. And I planted lots of oaks. Now, these are just examples of the plant lineages we put back on our property. I want to focus on oaks for a while because they are such important plants. This is the Bedford Oak in Bedford, New York, Martha Stewart land. Uh, people argue about whether it's 400 years old or 500 years old. It's enormous. And I hear people say all the time, I'm not going to plant an oak because I won't live long enough to enjoy it. And if you can only enjoy your oak when you're 400 years old or when it's 400 years old, you're right. You won't live long enough. But if you can enjoy what your oak is contributing to your local ecosystem, you can enjoy it right away that very first year. And I can say that with confidence because I planted most of my oaks as acorns, which means they were free. Or two foot bare root whips, which means they, they cost a dollar fifty each. And immediately they started to rebuild the food web by attracting the moths that create the caterpillars that support everything else. Things like the solitary oak leaf miner, 
Juvenile's dusky wing, the yellow shouldered moth, Suzuki's promolactus, the red washed caterpillar, the yellow vested moth, the orange tufted oneida, the spiny oak caterpillar, the two spotted oak punky, the variable oak leaf caterpillar, the red humped oak worm, the pink striped oak worm, the hesitant dagger moth, the lesser oak dagger moth, the greater oak dagger moth, the streak dagger moth, the afflicted dagger moth, the crown bugalatrix, the orange bat smoky wing, the white blotched heterocampa, the oblique heterocampa, the red line panopoda, the laugher, and literally hundreds more species of moths have come to the the oaks on our property and they come right away this is a pin oak that's just popped its head above the leaves and there's a caterpillar standing on the ground eating the leaves of that tree you do not have to wait decades for your oak to start to support the local food web it will do it right away this is what our house looks like today actually that's where the biden's was so um took this picture a couple of years ago Point is, we put a lot of plants back. And because we put the plants back, we brought a lot of life back to, to our yard. Now, over the years, I have learned that um, you, can, you can quantify the stability and productivity of your local food web simply by counting the number of moth species, because they're the major contributors. And that's what I've been doing for the last five years, taking pictures of every species of moth I could find at our, our house. I am up to 1,195 species of moths so far added another more than 100 this year. So it's still building. Who knows how high it'll get. Now, we have 10 acres. Pennsylvania is 2.4 million acres. So in one 240 thousandths of the land mass, um, we have 44% of all the moths that occur in the entire state. And because so many of these are types of bird food, we have recorded 60 species of birds that have bred on our 10 acres. Not flew by, but bred. Why am I telling you this? Well, this is another headline we see all the time. Uh, the World Wildlife Fund says that Earth has lost two-thirds of its wildlife since 1970. Terrible statistic. But I'm thinking, gee, not at our house. I'm convinced we have increased biodiversity by more than two-thirds, and it didn't take that long, and it wasn't that hard. All we did was put the plants back. Think how good it would be if everybody put the plants back. We could turn, turn this around. <laughs> I guess I'm just saying, don't give up. We really can make a big difference here. But I know what you're thinking. Gee, we've got 10, 10 acres and, and a lot of people have less land than that. Will it work on smaller properties, say in suburbia? That is a great question. So let's go to Margie and Dan Terpster's house in Kirkwood, Missouri, where they have 0.6 acres, 18 times less land than Cindy and I have. And when they moved in, their yard was completely um, taken over by bush honeysuckle, armor honeysuckle, an invasive plant from, from Asia. So they got rid of that. They put in 70 species of native plants, most of them flowering plants that help pollinators, a water feature. And then they sat back. Uh, their measure of, of productivity in their yard is to count the birds that are using their yard. And they're up to 149 species, including 35 warbler species. That's a big number. Just to put that in perspective, Cindy and I have only counted eight warbler species at our house. So does it work on smaller properties? Absolutely. What about urban yards? Let's go to Pam Carlson's house in Chicago. And I mean in Chicago, that's O'Hare Airport right over there. Pam has one-tenth of an acre. That's three times smaller than the average lot size in North America. Um, and she's not connected to any natural area at all. It's a pretty one-tenth of an acre, but it's a little teeny island. It's pretty because Pam is a, a native plant landscaper. She's a good one. But she did the same thing. She got rid of her non-native plants, put in 60 species of native plants, uh, included a, a water feature. And then she sat back, she says, with a glass of wine. I bet she had more than one glass of wine. And counted the birds. She's up to 124 species of birds that have used her yard, including a woodcock. There's Pam's woodcock. So if you haven't seen a woodcock lately, go to Pam's house in Chicago. All right, there are four things we need to think about if we're going to succeed in a big way, and we do want to succeed in a big way. And the first thing is to address those big lawns. We've got 44 million acres of lawn in this, this country dedicated to an ecological deadscape. If you're talking about pollinator habitat, I don't see any right there. Why do we have that much land dedicated to an ecological deadscape? Because... Lawn is a status symbol, and we need areas to display our Halloween decorations. But what if we cut the area of lawn in half? What if we took areas like this and turned them into this? I got this picture from Dan Getman. Never met Dan Getman, but uh, he's doing it. He had this big lawn, and he's putting in all these native plants, and he sent me this picture. 
This is the second year of, of his planning. Well, if everybody did that, that would give us 20 million acres we could start to restore right where we live. We could create what, what I'm calling homegrown national park because we're going to do it at home. And it'll be big. It'll be bigger, be bigger than the Adirondacks, plus Yellowstone, plus Yosemite, plus Grand Tetons, Canyonlands, Mount Rainier, North Cascades, Badlands National Park, Olympic National Park, Sequoia National Park, plus the Grand Canyon, plus Denali, which is huge. Plus the Great Smoky Mountains, add up all those parks, still less than 20 million acres. So Homegrown National Park is going to be the biggest park in the country. What do you get when you put a park at home? What do you get when you put some part of nature right where you live? You get the chance to interact with it. At your own time, your own pace, all you have to do is go outside or even just look out your window. You can avoid crowds. You know, if you go to a real national park, last year, there are 375 million people there with you. So you know what you're going to see. It's free. There's no admission fee. It's never closed, no matter what pandemic comes down the pike. No travel hassles. You get to experience the natural world alone, which I think is essential to developing that personal relationship with Mother Nature, not mediated by somebody else. And I think it's particularly, I know it's particularly important for our poor kids, who, according to Richard Liu, are suffering from nature deficit disorder. So we're trying. We get 30 kids. We put them on a bus with a teacher and they drive for an hour and they, they go to a natural area and then they walk around for an hour. Teacher tells them not to touch anything. And they get back in the bus and they go home. And that's their experience with the natural world, which I'm sure is better than nothing. But it's really been an experience with 30 other kids and a teacher telling them not to touch anything. If they have some part of the natural world right where they live, all they have to do is go outside alone and get to know it, become friends with it alone. No parental supervision. Let them work out this relationship on their own terms. When we hover over our kids, we are sending the message that this is dangerous stuff. That's a bad message to send to, to make our kids fear the natural world because they're the stewards. They're the future stewards of our planet. If they're afraid of it, if they don't how to be a steward, if they don't love being a steward, they're going to be lousy stewards and we can't afford any more lousy stewardship. And maybe they will learn how to hunt lizards I'm learning this from my granddaughter, Zoe, who's the one that gave me this coal. Um, she lives in Hawaii in a very modest patch of, of nature, a piece of grass and a hedge. But there are anole lizards there. And when she discovered that, she sent me this picture to describe how you hunt lizards. You get on the ground and you cover yourself with leaves and sticks so that the lizards can't see you coming. And then you crawl very slowly toward the lizard. No smiling. This is serious business. You can wear your best dress. That's okay. But you sneak up on the lizard. You catch the lizard. You put it in an aquarium. You learn how to take care of a lizard. You form a personal relationship with that part of Mother Nature. You fall in love with that part of Mother Nature. Now, I don't think Zoe's going to be crawling on the ground the rest of her life in her best dress catching lizards. But I guarantee, well, maybe, I don't know. She sent me this picture, so who knows. But I guarantee she's going to remember catching lizards in Hawaii the rest of her life. And I guarantee she's going to be a good steward of the planet because of that and other experiences. If you want your kids to do more than catch lizards, get Nancy Stranisti's Nature Play at Home, dozens of examples of how to expose kids to the natural world. And if you want to join Homegrown National Park, you can do it. Go to homegrownnationalpark.org. It's free. All you're doing is registering your property in the area you're going to be a good steward of. So if you really do cut your area of, of lawn in half, you put that area down there. Uh, if you plant a tree and you protect it, if you put an aster in a flower pot, uh, it's good enough. You're now a member of Homegrown National Park. Your little piece of your county is going to light up. And the goal is to get the whole country to light up. You know, we have this 3030 initiative. Uh, people call it Biden's initiative. It's really the UN's initiative where we're going to say 30 percent of the planet by 2030. It's got to include um homeowner uh, conservation efforts, and we need to record it all on the Homegrown National Park map. So what are we asking? Reduce the area of lawn would be great. Plant more natives, particularly those real contributors. Remove the invasive species that are already on your property. Most people have them. And protect any natural areas that are associated with your, your property. What's our product? It's national awareness, not just of what the problem is, but what the solution is. It's a change culture, the recognition that nature is not optional. It's essential and everybody has responsibility to sustaining it. And again, the measurable progress towards that 30-30 initiative. 
The benefits, it converts hope into action. We get to do something, not just talk about it, but we can do it. It doesn't rely on any governmental support. Um, we'd love it, but it's okay. Grassroots, grassroots solution here. It merges all the conservation efforts that already exist. Audubon, National Wildlife Federation, Wild Ones, Xerces, uh, because we're not charging, you can join Home Grown National Park, even though you're a member of all these guys. And then we get to have that, that visual um, record of, of uh, all of the conservation that's happening in the country. And if there are holes in our biological carters that we're creating, we'll be able to see it on the map. So we want to join Home Grown National Park. We want to shrink the lawn. What plants should we put in the area that was once lawn? I'm going to argue that some of them have to be keystone plants. Remember what a keystone is. It's a stone in the middle of the arch, the Roman arch. And if you take that stone out of the arch, the arch collapses. Well, if you take keystone plants out of your local food web, the food web collapses because they are making most of the food. Just 14% of our native plants are making 90% of the caterpillar food that drives those food webs. So think of the keystone plants in the ecological house that you're building outdoors as the two by fours that hold up that house. They're essential. They're the support system. You cannot build a house, an ecological house, out of wallpaper. And that's what we've been trying to do for the past century. So the question is no longer simply are native plants better than non-natives ecologically. On average, they certainly are. But there, you know, there are a lot of natives that aren't contributing all that much either. So the question really is, do we want to focus on those big contributors, the ones that are supporting the most uh, pollinators and the most food webs or not? What is the number one keystone plant in terms of, of, of supporting food webs? It's, it's uh, oaks, one of the oaks. In 84% of the counties in which they occur, they support more caterpillars than any other plant genus, over 950 species nationwide. Tulip tree, for example, another great native plant, but only supports 21. So the huge differences among our trees. That's what I mean by contributor versus not. Um, if you uh, want to know what the best keystone plants are where you live, uh, National Wildlife Federation has a, a new uh, tool up there, Keystone Plants by Eco Region. There's the, the uh, URL. You go to this website and it will give you the best keystone uh, plants for making caterpillars and the best plants for supporting specialist pollinators um, by Eco Region. So there's a map there. You can see which Eco Region you belong to. All right, we're going to put it in, we're going to shrink the lawn, we're going to put in keystone plants, we're going to invite a lot of insects to our yard, and then we're going to kill them with our security light, which is not the goal. This is all the ways that, that light pollution at night is killing insects. Um, <clears throat> and you know what, I, I find this good news. We have to stop the decline of insects. Earth has already lost more than 45% of its insects. They are the little things that run the world. And if we can stop it and reverse it, actually have insect populations grow again, just by flicking a switch, we're getting off easy. So that's, <laughs> excuse me, that's great, but there's a lot of uh, flip switches to flick, but we're good switch flickers. But I know what you're going to say, well, I can't turn the, the light off over my barn or over my front porch or my garage because the bad man will come. All right, put a motion sensor on it so it only turns on when the bad man does come. And the first thing you're going to realize is the bad man doesn't come very often. And if you don't want to do that, take the white bulb out of your security light and put in a yellow bulb, regular yellow bulb or a yellow LED. You can get them at, at uh, your local hardware store. Yellow wavelengths are far less attractive to uh, nocturnal insects, particularly those moths that make all of those, those caterpillars. Uh, so overnight, if we switch to yellow bulbs, we could um, save millions of insects. And if we used LEDs, millions of dollars too. All right, we're going to, <clears throat> we're going to shrink the lawn. We're going to put in keystone plants. We're going to modify our light system. Then we're going to invite a mosquito fogger to come kill all our insects, including the pollinators. This is a booming business around the country. Um, it is undoing everything I've been talking about for the last 15 years. Um, it's terrible. Uh, so these companies will say, well, gee, it's okay because this is a natural product. And it is. It's pyrethroids, industrial strength pyrethroids. That's the compound which is in chrysanthemums, and it evolved there to kill insects. Um, but, you know, being natural, that means nothing. Cyanide is a natural product too, but it's still toxic. They also say it only kills mosquitoes. And I wish that was true, but it's not even close to true. 
Uh, it kills all the insects it comes in contact with, including uh, monarchs. Big monarch kills two years ago when they flew through mosquito gel. The interesting thing is it doesn't control mosquitoes. You don't control mosquitoes in the adult stage. You control it in the larval stage. It is too hard to control mosquitoes in the adult stage. You have to kill 90% of them to get control. Uh, these, these companies kill between 10 and 50%. So they're not even close to being effective, which is why they have to be coming back, coming back and, and charging you each time. If you really want to control mosquitoes, um, use biological control. Get a, get a bucket, fill it full of water, put in a handful of straw or hay or maybe dead grass, or dead leaves, and put it out in the sun. You're going to build up the populations of diatoms and algae. And that is what mosquito larvae eat. It becomes an irresistible brew to mosquito females that want to lay their eggs in there. So once they do, then you go to the hardware store and you buy a sheet of mosquito dunks, $9. This is Bacillus thuringiensis. It's a natural bacterium that only kills aquatic diptera. And the only aquatic dipterin in your bucket is a mosquito larva. Very targeted, very cheap, very effective. If a dragonfly gets in here, it won't hurt it. If your dog drinks it, it won't hurt it. This is the way to do it, particularly if everybody did, it would be very effective. But you know what? If you're going to have a party in your backyard and you just worry about those mosquitoes, get a fan. Turn on the fan. It, it creates enough airflow that the mosquitoes can't fly into it. Very effective. And you don't have to kill anything. Okay, the fourth thing we need to think about is landscaping in a way that allows caterpillars to complete their development. What do I mean by that? Well, here's just an example. I live in Chester County, Pennsylvania, where oaks support 511 species of caterpillars. A few of them, like the polyphemus moth, complete their development on the tree. The caterpillar eats the leaves, then it spins a cocoon and hangs from, from one of the branches, then it emerges as an adult, then it does it all over again. I wish everything did that, but most species don't. They will finish growing as caterpillars on the tree and then they drop from the tree and they wiggle their way beneath the, the soil surface and pupate underground. <laughs> or they spin a cocoon in the leaf litter that is under the tree. And that's the problem. There is no leaf litter under the tree. We don't tolerate it. We have this notion that it's good earth stewardship to have grass going right up to our trees. And we mow and compact the soil so it's so tough the caterpillars can't get underground, which means the way we landscape in so many places is an ecological trap. The moths come in, lay their eggs, caterpillars develop, drop down and die. And I'm convinced this is another major cause of insect declines particularly in our more developed areas. And of course, the cement landscape is not the option either. This is what most people do. They have a tree in a yard. I've got a new grad student this summer, uh, this year, who is starting to measure how well caterpillars do in a situation like this. But I guarantee they're going to do better in a situation like this, where you have a layered landscape, a soft landing. This is a tree, maybe a dogwood here, native azalea, then ferns and ground cover. Caterpillar drops down. The soil is not compacted. They can easily get underneath the soil. They can pupate. They can, they can spin their cocoon. Much higher survivorship. This is where you can do your spring ephemeral gardening. You put beds around your trees. That's how you shrink the lawn. The bigger, the better. These are great soft sites for soft landings for the caterpillars. Use your native ground covers um, liberally. Things like wild ginger, native pachysandra. Uh, here's the Virginia creeper being a great ground cover. Golden seal, there's a lot of options. May, may apple, foam flower, ferns, all great options. You know, if you can see the ground, you don't have enough plants. Green mulch is the best mulch, and it's wonderful for those caterpillars. Okay, another uh, former grad student, Desiree Narango, did some wonderful work with um, chickadees, excuse me, in the suburbs of, of Washington, D.C. And she had one simple question which um, the results of which suggest there actually is room for compromise. For all of you who have heard that I'm not willing to compromise, yes, I am. And here's the data to, to uh, support that. She asked, um, how well do chickadee populations do in landscapes that are dominated by native plants versus landscapes dominated by introduced plants? And she found when they're dominated by introduced plants, they support 75% fewer caterpillars. So right away, you reduce the amount of, of bird food by 75%. They're 60% less likely to have breeding chickadees at all. Nest boxes up in everybody's yard, but the chickadees would come and look around and say, there's not enough to eat here. We're not even going to try. If they did try, they laid 1.5 fewer eggs. Those clutches were 29% less likely to survive. If they did survive, they, they produce 1.2 fewer fledglings, and it took them 1.5 days longer to do that. 
And if you put all that into a population growth model as a function of the percentage of non-native woody plant biomass from none to 100%, in your yard, this is what you get. We focused on woody plants because that's where chickadees forage. The dotted line you see there, right in the middle, that is replacement rate. That is a rate at which uh, the population has to make babies to replace the adults that die every year. If you, if you reproduce at that rate, you have a sustainable population. It's not growing, but it's not shrinking either. If you uh, make more babies than adults die, you have a growing population. But if you make fewer babies, which happens when you have a lot of non-native plants, then you have an unsustainable shrinking population. Now, right here is where those lines overlap, um, uh, liberally interpreting, which means you can have up to 30% of the woody plant biomass in your yard non-native without compromising the, the local food web. Now we can't we can't tolerate any uh, invasive plants. Those are ecological tumors. They they escape our yards and and destroy local ecosystems. But there are plenty of uh, um, introduced plants that are not invasive. Remember Dan Getman? Did you notice that this was a ginkgo? Why does Dan have a ginkgo in his native plant planting? Because Dan's wife said, "I like ginkgos and I want you to put one in," and he did. Is it destroying the productivity of this landscape? No. Is it invasive? Is it moving around? No. It's not contributing anything, but it's not removing anything either. So I, I like to think of plants like this uh, as if, if they were statues. So there you go. Um, there's Dan's statue. But how many statues do you want? If you have a whole yard of statues, maybe that's, that's too many. <laughs> it's not the presence of non-native plants that destroys food webs. It's the absence of those big contributors, those native, native keystone plants. Um, and if we increase the percentage of these, we can tolerate these as well. Can we use native plants in formal designs? Of course we can. This is a Lynn O'Shaughnessy design. You don't get more formal than that. This is taken by a drone 400 feet up. Every plant in that landscape, many of which are supporting pollinators, is a native plant. Formality is a function of the design. It's not a function of the plants in the design. Our native plants uh, are used in formal designs in Europe every day. And I guess that's okay because they're non-native plants there. Can we get a pollinator garden into a, a suburban yard like this without offending anybody? Of course we can. Put a little fence around it. It formalizes it. It tells your neighbors that this is this is not uh, a, just a bunch of weeds you forgot to mow. It's not very big, but it is meeting the needs of, of several species of of bees. Remember why we need pollinators? You hear all the time we need them because they pollinate a third of our crops. I don't like that argument because I hear people say, well, I don't live next to a farm, so I don't need any pollinators. Forget the crop argument. We need pollinators because they pollinate most of the plants that are out there. So where do we need pollinators? Every place we need plants, which is every place. How about this? A Drew Latham design, much bigger. Imagine the amount of life, the amount of pollinators supported here versus the amount of pollinators supported here. Seems like a no-brainer. Can municipalities help us live with nature? Of course they can. And Minnesota was leading the way several years ago. It's got a cost-sharing program. The state pays people to reduce or eliminate their lawn and replace it with appropriate prairie plantings, all of which are great pollinator plants. There's an island in Florida, or at least there was before uh, the hurricane came, that is paying its residents to allow burrowing owls to burrow in the front yard. Burrowing owls are listed species. This is the way the Endangered Species Act should have been, been written. We're gonna pay people to be good stewards of endangered species on their property rather than fine you if you use your property. Everybody would want an endangered species. Put a bounty on, on invasive ornamentals like, like calorie pear. That's what St. Louis, Missouri did, Fayetteville, Arkansas, South Carolina has banned them altogether. North Carolina has a bounty on it. You take out a calorie pear, you get a free tree replacement. And uh, utilities, public utilities, particularly in the, in the West are giving people $100 coupons to plant water efficient native species rather than the thirsty non-natives. <coughs> and of course the big, uh, lawn replacement programs in California. This has gone up. It's now $3 per square foot rebate for every square foot of lawn you take out and put in a Zurich planning. We need to get this message to Kim Kardashian, who's using more water in Hollywood than anybody else. 
And if you want more information on all these programs, memorize that. All right, I think we've made three missteps in the early years of conservation. Um, this first one's important. We're starting to think of nature as if it's optional. We like it, we like to visit it, uh, but it's not essential. And if it's not essential, when push comes to shove, when resources are in short supply, which is always, then nature takes a back seat. <clears throat> Went to the Cincinnati Zoo before the uh, virus broke out, and there's this well-sized poster there, which to me epitomizes our society's view of conservation. We want to save wildlife. We want to save nature so the future generations can enjoy it. That was Teddy Roosevelt's argument for the national park system. They're wonderful places. We have to save them so the future generations can enjoy them. But to me, that just promotes the idea that nature's there just for entertainment. It's far more than that. We need to save nature so that we have future generations. A little bit more urgent. We've also assumed that humans and nature cannot coexist. I talked about that, but if we restrict our conservation efforts to areas where there's very few humans, we're going to fail because there are not enough of, of those areas left anymore. David Quammen has a great analogy between a Persian rug <coughs> and an ecosystem. This is a functional Persian rug. That is not 71 Persian rugs. That's 71 rug fragments, none of which are acting like a Persian rug. And that's exactly what we've done to our ecosystems. The UN designates biosphere reserves as places of ecological significance. I don't like that language because it suggests there are places on planet Earth with no ecological significance. Not so. Every square inch of the planet has ecological significance, including our yards, including our corporate landscapes, including our roadsides, including much of our agriculture. So we need to put the plants back and glue our rug back together again. And we can do it. We are doing it, not just to make biological carters that allow plants and animals to move back and forth between viable habitat, but to create viable habitat where we've destroyed it. And when we do that, it's going to be the first time in modern history where humans are actually coexisting with the natural world. Our third misstep was to leave our stewardship to just a few specialists, a few ecologists, a few conservation biologists. For some reason, we did not see it as an inherent responsibility of everybody on the planet. But I don't know why, because every single person on the planet depends entirely on the quality of local ecosystems. So why wouldn't everybody bear the responsibility of taking care of those ecosystems? Stan Rushworth, a Cherokee elder, once said, the Western settler mindset is, I have rights. The mindset of indigenous people is, I have obligations. You're not born with those mindsets. You're taught them. We've been really good at teaching this one. We've been terrible at teaching our kids and our peers that we all have obligations to good earth stewardship. That doesn't mean you have to save biodiversity for a living, but you can save it where you live. And if you do, it empowers you. And right now, more and more people are recognizing the earth has some serious problems, but we all feel powerless. What can one person do? Well, one person can shrink their lawn, one person can, can uh, change their light bulbs and their nocturnal lights, one person can use keystone plants, one person can put in a pollinator garden, one person can remove the invasive plants on their property, we didn't talk much about that. Um, one person can do all the things I just talked about and totally revitalize the little ecosystem on their yard and then enhance their local ecosystem instead of continuing to detract it. And it shrinks the problem down to something that's manageable for each one of us. Don't think about the entire world's problem. Just worry about the piece of the world, the piece of the earth that you are influencing. If you own property, it's obvious. That's where you start. If you don't own property, help somebody who does. Help a land conservancy or park or preserve. They're all underfunded. They're all understaffed. They will love you as a volunteer. So as a property owner or a volunteer, each one of us has the power, and we certainly have the responsibility to fix dead landscapes like this. Whether or not we do so is going to determine nature's fate and then ultimately our own fate. I think I've convinced my grandkids that you are pollinator's best hope. I hope I've convinced you as well. Thanks very much. Great, thank you so much, Doug. Folks, I'm gonna open up the um, chat box again. If you, some of you wanted to share some links or other ideas in there. Um, 
Doug, I wanted to mention because it came up in the Q&A box um, several times that we do post this recording and we invite uh, everyone to share that recording. Um, you can share it with your garden group, with a, a local community. Some people asked about how to get their condo associations interested in, in uh, and behind native plants. And that's exactly why we post these recordings. So in fact, I was down at a garden club meeting this past winter and that's what they did. They, they uh, showed the Doug's presentation and we did some Q&A. Um, so please use those recordings. Um, many of our questions were about how do we get others interested? And there's a, you know, an, a real obvious place to start. You already have the choir kind of convinced, but how do you spread out from there? Um, Doug, there were a few questions about your uh, five-gallon bucket mosquito trap. You answered most of those, but uh, several people wondered, if you're bringing in mosquitoes and trapping them, are there enough mosquitoes or food out there for bats and other predators? Well, you know, life is full of trade-offs. First of all, many of the mosquitoes that are really pestiferous to us, particularly the ones spreading diseases, are uh, invasive species themselves. Aedes aegypti, you know, comes from Egypt. Asian tiger mosquito, pesty little thing. Uh, so they're not native mosquitoes. We're not wiping out the mosquito populations. Uh, and remember, you're we're talking about where you, right where you live. You're not living in the middle of a swamp where you're producing lots of mosquitoes that support everything. I, I trust. If you don't want to kill your mosquitoes, that is fine with me. But uh, rather than hiring Mosquito Joe, this is a much better way to go. Okay, great. Uh, folks, I know it's a little after the hour, so if you have to hop off, remember we're going to continue to record the um, 10 minutes or so of Q&A, so you can always come back in on the recording and um, hear those answers. So Alice asked very um, um, nicely, is it better to have oaked uh, and lost or never to have oaked at all? So she's wondering if you're on a property where you've only, you're have only you only gonna be there five years or so, um, should you go ahead and plant a small oak uh, or is it something you need kind of a long view for? No, remember that picture of the caterpillar eating the oak in the first year? It'll contribute to your local ecosystem, whether or not you live there. Uh, and it'll start right away. So if you're going to live there five years, in five years, your oak's going to be much bigger than you think it will be. I have a picture of, of uh, a young white oak in my yard. I think it was year three. And in the first crotch, there was a, a nest of a field sparrow. Um, so yeah, please, please plant them. It does, you, you're not going to chop it down when you when you move. So somebody else gets to enjoy the benefits of that oak as well. Hopefully, right. Hopefully they won't go in and, and yeah, right, uh, right. do a clear cut, right. Um, so there are were a few questions about um, cold temperatures coming, frost freeze. Do you have some suggestions for how to help insects and others over winter? Um, some ways we can, um, some some um, practices we can establish outside. Well, yeah, this is all about um, that habitat we're talking about, uh, including bees. And I'm pretty sure Heather will tell you about this, but our bees need to overwinter. Uh, just like the other other insects, and many of them overwinter winter in the stems, the dead stems of uh, the previous year's growth. So when we cut everything down, when we clean up in the fall, we're removing. So I'm talking about your goldenrod and your your asters and your your black eyed susans. You're removing the overwintering sites of um, a lot of those native bees. When you uh, rake up and throw away all your leaves, uh, you're removing the overwintering sites of of uh, a lot of those caterpillars that were in your trees. So it's the fall cleanup that's so hard on our, our insects. Try to, I, I get it, we have to move things around on our property. Um, we, you know, I say reduce the lawn rather than get rid of it. And the lawn we keep should be manicured. That's a cue for care so that we're not thrown out of our, our developments. But, so we have to get the leaves and things off the lawn. Keep them somewhere on your property. In your, in your beds is the best place. And you will help overrunning insects uh, a lot. Okay. A few folks wanted to know if you could repeat the name of uh, the um, Nature Play book, and I put the link in there as well. Nature Play at home. Nancy Stranisti. Right. Okay, great. And then also uh, lots of questions around how do I find the list of keystone plants? How do I find the specialist bees? Um, how do I find the plants for moths and butterflies? I put that link in there as well. It's also on our webpage, but Doug, can you, can you mention the uh, plant finder? 
Yeah, well, you you go to National Wildlife Federation website, and then there, there's there's two tools called one's called Native Plant Finder, uh, and it, it, you put in your zip code and the ranked list of both woody and, and herbaceous plants for your county will pop up. And this new one is is uh, Keystone Plants by Eco Region that will direct you to the best plants, particularly the specialist the plants that are great for specialist pollinators um, by Eco Region. So. You Great, thank you. And those are really nice, tidy little lists, folks. So especially if you want to forward that to um, a friend who might be interested. Um, so I put the the both of those uh, links are on our web page. I put the one uh, in there. So it's handy. Um, there were a couple questions about, uh, you know, I don't have 10 acres. I wish I did. And you, you sort of answered this already, but maybe you could reiterate what can someone with a uh, who's maybe a beginner or has a small space or a low budget? Where do you start? The easiest thing in most most places of the country, it's got to be got to be biome appropriate. But the easiest thing is to plant a tree, to plant a small tree, <laughs> plant that egg corn. That's that is really easy. It's cheap and it will grow and and do wonderful things for your yard. Uh, so anybody on a small budget can do that. Um, then take care of it. Put put that bed around the tree. You've reduced the area you have in lawn. You're you're it's still only one tree, but they they do grow. Uh, a lot of people say, well, I'm just going to, I'm going to create a meadow and that's great, but it's also one of the hardest things to do um, for a number of reasons. Um, so I don't know. That's, that's what I would, that's what I did do. I started by planting the woody plants and uh, an awful lot of things have come to our property. Um, and how do we get others involved? How do you get your neighbor, you know, you've got this wonderful little ecosystem around you, but how do you get your neighbors involved or your community, your schools um, you know, how do we spread this word? Yeah, that, ha that has been the challenge. I think about it every day. Um, I'd love to have a, a bring your neighbor night. You know, if you've got this recording, have, make some popcorn and invite your neighbor who would never, ever think about this over and say, you know, don't proselytize. You know, neighbors don't want their neighbors telling them how to live. But you can say, hey, I just stumbled across this. It seems pretty cool. Maybe we can watch it together. I don't know. Always want to see how that would work, but you know what? I do have a, a, a almost a twenty-year perspective on this. It, it is spreading pretty quickly now. Um, I cannot keep up with with the interest in in this. So the needle is moving. The headlines are helping. People don't want to hear how our birds and insects are disappearing. How we're going to lose a million species. They're upset about that. And the message here is, you can do something about it. That's a powerful message, and a lot of people are they want to do that. So. Um, the people who are in the non-choir usually just, they don't know that this is important. They don't know that they need nature. It's, it's, it's lack of information rather than I don't want to do it. And once they do hear about it, I hear about conversions all the time. Mm -hmm. And like you said, just a small step, you start to see the, the results. Someone commented that uh, she just planted an oak and now is seeing lots of blue jays out there. It really doesn't take long for, um, for the animals to respond. Mm -hmm. So again, Doug, thank you so much for your presentation, for your time, for all that you do, the energy and passion you put in your work.